Hi guys. So holy cow, what a couple of weeks we've had. Um, I want to tell you something funny before I get into the nitty gritty of today's lecture, which is, well, funny, haha, because you have to laugh, right? Um, some of you may have had me for previous classes where I've talked about my dislike of hermit crabs. And before you judge, if you haven't had a hermit crab, you don't know what I'm talking about. But there, there's nothing hermit about them. They have to have like a group of at least 10 in order to be healthy. And if you didn't know this, if you don't have a sufficient group size, then they commit suicide. Yeah. Now are you on the same page with me? Okay, so think back to last week, snow, chaos, lights going on and off, just insanity, right? Well, we didn't realize that three of our hermit crabs are actually frozen. And so there's just one lone survivor left. And funny enough, he we call him Mandalorian. We're big Star Wars fans. Anyway, so he's the lone ranger left. And I go into my son's room to grab some blankets and, and some toys and stuff. And I see at the corner of my eye, the Mandalorian and he's like ripping off pieces of his shell. And I mean, it was just like super dramatic. And I'm just like, why of all times now? And then I realized he was mad because his buddies had frozen. So kind of sad. So I got him out of the, the tank, stopped him from ripping himself apart. <laughs> so in essence, if you want an analogy, um, hermit crabs to me are kind of like divas. Um, if they were like a celebrity, they would want like all white M&Ms or something. <laughs> So that is my funny story to start today's class. So you should be able to see, let me make my head smaller. There we go. Um, you should be able to see our PowerPoint. Let me go ahead and make it. Doo, doo, doo. There we go. Full size. And today we're going to go over chapter five, which is all about electronically stored information. Now I want to tell you something that's kind of shocking, which is um, most textbooks, even in the year 2021, do not give enough, if any, attention to this area, which is shocking in light of the fact that, guys, what do we do most of our communicating on? It's not via hard mail. It's not via paper and pen. It's now this, right? So the majority of your work as you get into the criminal justice system as a professional, will have in some way, shape or form something to do with electronically stored information. So that's why I really harp on this chapter and FYI, um, the textbook that I'm writing, which will be out in the fall, I develop three full chapters to nothing but this, because this is the future, we are in the future. So the fact that our textbook only dev devotes one chapter to this topic is kind of like, ah, craziness to me. Um, but I'll get off my soapbox on that front. So let's just go ahead and talk about what we're gonna talk about today, which is I wanna go over a couple of things from chapter four um, that was covered before all the craziness. And um, I also wanna bring your attention to something that I'm going to focus on in this week's pack back discussion board, which I hope you'll have fun with because it really requires you or will require you, I should say, to analyze a specific search warrant um, and whether or not it's valid. And if it is valid, why? And if not, why not? But it's, it's trickier than you think, right? Um, and then the rest of today will focus on nothing but electronically stored information, all that's contained in chapter five, right? So let's just start out with some recapping first. You guys should have gone over chapter four if you have not, or if you forgot, which is okay, <laughs> um, what was contained in it, go back and rewatch it because it is imperative that you understand what a valid proper search warrant contains before moving on in the class. If you can't off the top of your head right now, tell me what makes a proper search warrant then stop here and rewatch the chapter four video lecture um, that's still available, okay? So a search warrant, first and foremost, it has to be based on probable cause. And that's not just something that's made up, guys. That is something that's in the what amendment? Not the first, not the second, not the third, the fourth, the fourth amendment. The fourth amendment specifically requires that no search or seizure or no search warrant shall be issued, but upon Da, 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 probable cause. You have to have probable cause in order to even uh, attempt to gain a search warrant, 
period, the end. If you don't have probable cause, eh, no search warrant. So based on that, and I see my computer, okay, there we go. I froze there for a second. Um, so the key though, the million dollar question to determine whether or not it's a search warrant is or is not valid is whether it is sufficiently particular. Now on the next exam, this has to be in your answers. I will have, I think three to four, I haven't decided yet, short answers. And one of them will uh, pertain to search warrants. If I don't see those beautiful words, sufficiently particular, and you won't get any credit because that is the key to having a valid search warrant is whether the details that are included within your search warrant whether or not they're sufficiently particular. If they're not, then it's not a valid search warrant. So for instance, if you have a search warrant and you say that a Sony television was stolen from 1234 Main Street, that is not sufficiently particular. Why? Because it could be a TV like this behind me, or it could be an old school tube TV that's huge and weighs like you know 80 pounds, or it could be a teeny tiny TV. Um, there's a whole range of televisions that are out there. So the fact that you just say Sony, well, let's say you're an officer. And here is where I want you to put your imagination hats on. Imagine you're a law enforcement officer and you're looking at your search warrant and it says you're, you're entitled to seize upon finding a Sony television. And then you walk into this residence that you're permitted to walk into because of your search warrant. And you're faced with not one, not two, not three, but four different Sony televisions. How would you know which one is the stolen one? Well, the answer is you wouldn't. So therefore it's not valid. So whenever you're confronted with a search warrant question, always imagine that you're the law enforcement officer and you're walking into that situation and ask yourself, would you know what to seize? If the answer is no, it's a bad warrant. If the answer is yes, then yeah, right on, green light, go for it. Now, um, what about this in a search warrant? If it had an unknown brand or manufacturer, but it was a 357 Magnum and it had the engraved name of Lisa on it. Now that's sufficiently particular. Why? It doesn't say who made the gun. Well, again, imagine you're a law enforcement officer and you're confronted with four different 357 Magnums. Well, you'd be looking for the one that has the engraved name of Lisa. That's pretty darn sufficiently particular. So it is a high probability there's not another gun with the name Lisa engraved into the, the handle. So therefore that's sufficiently particular and right on, keep going, seize it. So the theme that I want you to have in your head moving forward is that someone has been or is committing a crime or the evidence will be in a particular place to be seized. That is the standard guys for probable cause to obtain a search warrant. If you can't show the judge that someone has been or is committing a crime or that evidence will be in a particular place to be seized, then the judge shouldn't um, issue a search warrant. There is a certain degree of certainty within these um, offerings. I, I guess I should say I'm going blank on how to, how to phrase that, but there, there is a certain degree of certainty that is required in order to show a judge that you should get a search warrant based on the, this particular information. And that search warrant needs to reflect sufficient particularity in the things or thing that is being described that should be seized or can be seized. All right, so this is a sneak peek on what I want you to look at in this week's pack back. And it actually has, uh, is an example, and I don't want you guys, do not look up this case. If you do, I will know. But don't look up that case. Just look at the facts here to determine one, what facts in the affidavit support the issuance of a search warrant? And then number two, what reasons can you explain for denying the search warrant based on the insufficiency of the search warrant? Remember a slide before, I said you have to show that a person is or uh, is committing a crime or that evidence will be found. Does this uh, description of a search warrant indicate those details? And secondly, the details that are included within the search warrant, are they sufficiently particular that a particular person is committing a crime? That's a big hint.
Okay, so that's my sneak peek. That is what your pack back is all about this week. Um, and also keep in mind that your search warrant isn't a golden ticket to search anywhere within an environment. Rather, it only extends to an area which the item or items could be hidden. So if you're looking for a stolen car, then why the heck would you be looking underneath the bed? The answer is you shouldn't. So if you find something of a criminal nature in an area in which the item that you're looking for, there's no way in heck that it could be found, then it's not gonna be admissible in court. Yeah, folks, it would be excluded. So make sure as a law enforcement officer, if that's the path you choose, that you're looking in areas that only that item or items could reasonably be found. Now, if you're looking for drugs, now that opens up the door a little bit wider, right? Because there's a whole host of places that could house drugs. So that's a little different, right? Now, whoop, there we go. Um, now, if it's not named in the warrant, but it satisfies the doctrine of plain view, then you can seize it. Every semester I get the question of, well, what if the, you come into an area and it's not in the warrant, but they find a bloody knife? Well, of course, seize it, right? Unless it's like a butcher shop. <laughs> you know, context matters. Where are you? So if it's in plain view, meaning it's immediately apparent in its criminal nature, then uh, it would satisfy plain view and you can seize it, even though it's not named in the warrant. But again, it has to be immediately apparent in criminal nature, meaning you as an officer can't manipulate the situation to better see it. So let's say I'm going to, okay, let's just pretend that this is a tabletop and you think that underneath this phone is evidence of crack cocaine. You cannot pick up this phone to get a better look. That equals manipulation. Just the simple taking of your hand, picking up the phone and picking it up, that's manipulation and that's not plain view. Plain view literally means that you don't have to touch the situation in any way, shape or form, that it's readily apparent that that is something, that's a no-no. That's something that's criminal, right? Now, um, ba -ba -bum. The, if you get a search warrant for a business, um, you have to make sure that the business and the buildings that you're looking at are named in the search warrant because a lot of buildings, especially in larger cities, have adjoining buildings. Um, you have to make sure that that building is indeed a part of that business and that it's named in the search warrant. If not, then the, it may lead to a question as to whether or not you as a law enforcement officer can enter or access that adjoining building. Um, pause right here on curtilage. We will revisit that soon. Okay, so pause on that. Don't even think about that now. I'm going to skip over that. Okay, so now we turn our attention to chapter five, which is all about ESI, electronically stored information. So electronically stored information is not something that was thought of, but I mean, 1988, y'all probably weren't even born then, which is insane. Um, but, you know, we had phones like this. This is not a uh, high tech by any means. Now we have, and this is 2017, um, phones that do very high tech stuff. Poor blockbusters. See, this this slide actually makes me sad. I, there's a documentary, by the way, and if you haven't watched it, you should, about the last standing blockbuster. Um, but, you know, there was no Netflix. We couldn't binge watch on stuff. I remember specifically going to Blockbuster to get a movie and somebody had checked out the last one and I was devastated. And the sad thing is they never returned it. And I, every week I'll go back looking for it and the one VHS was never there. So it was like my, my nemesis had this VHS tape that they never returned. Um, so yeah, things are all online now. And I put this here and I emphasize this, not just to make you smile, hopefully, but also to emphasize the fact that you now have a, a, a pattern, a track record online. Everything you do from the moment you get on your computer, you turn it on and you type in something that is tracked. You have a, a path, a, a means of activity that are identified, tracked, um, assessed on a daily basis. Um, you have a profile that fits you. They'll see what kind of movies does Bob like? What type of, what time of day does Bob watch movies? Does he change his movie habits from Monday to Friday to Saturday to Sunday? Does he work? What movies does he watch at work? What does he look up at work? All of these things uh, comprise you. You have an online presence, an online profile that 
is represents who you are and is probably the most accurate portrayal of who you are in reality. Um, so this is actually an old statistic. This was back in 2018, I believe. So it's probably a little higher as of right now. But within the next five years, over 90% of Americans will own at least one smart electronic device. Now, I want to point out here um, that there is still, so just because you have access to a device does not mean you have access to reliable internet or reliable um, Wi-Fi. And this is something I actually wrote about, and I'm, I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm just simply putting it out there um, that when the start of COVID happened, when we all moved to online classes, it concerns me because I know a lot of students have access issues. They may have a cell phone, but they may not have a laptop or they may have a laptop, but they don't have Wi-Fi. And if they have Wi-Fi, they have to go to a certain place for it. So there is still, as of 2020, 2021, um, access issues that um, should be taken into consideration, especially with this move towards more heavy reliance in this online platform. So anyway, neither here nor there, but I just wanted to point that out. Um, so this is the technical definition, which y'all don't have to know by heart, but I do want you to see it. And basically it's anything you do that requires an electronic device. So when you text, when you write a note, when you write an email, when you do this class, when you watch something, when somebody calls you, when you call somebody else. Um, all of these things are tracked and recorded and created using digital devices, electronic devices. Now, all of these can be found in emails, voicemails, which by the way, does anybody ever leave voicemails anymore? I have to say, whenever I get a phone call and somebody leaves, and I'm not talking about y'all, if it's a student, I totally understand. But if it's like my mom, I'm like, why leave a voicemail? Just having that voicemail with the number one on my phone, I'm like, ugh, isn't that strange? Um, so voicemails, text messages, instant messages, any type of documents you do, Microsoft, Excel, PowerPoint, any of those, all of those constitute electronically stored information, which is amazing because in the new digital age that we live in, these are all areas that you as a criminal justice professional can access as long as you're able to show probable cause and reasonable suspicion in some circumstances. And I'll go into that here in a second. So this last, or the week before last, before all the snow craziness, I asked y'all about the Amazon Echo. And I was kind of giving y'all a sneak peek into this week. Um, but essentially, the Amazon Echo murder case was a case in which law enforcement for the first time ever thought that they could obtain information about a murder uh, that was, they believe, contained on a recorded conversation from an Amazon Echo device. Now think about that. That means, sorry, my two-year-old daughter's like peeking in. Um, that means that they believed that Amazon was recording this individual 24 seven. Now, yes, indeed, these smart devices only wake up when their smart word is activated. Like, hey Siri, oh, she's awake. <laughs> so- And a good morning to you. Oh, good morning to you. Um, so yeah, the, these devices are only supposed to technically wake up when you say these trigger words, right? But the, way in which they identify these trigger words is that they're always listening. If they weren't always listening, they wouldn't be able to identify these trigger words, right? These wake up words. So police thought about this and they thought, well, wait a minute, if they're always listening, that means they're recording somewhere. So let's access that and we'll see what happened prior to this murder that we're investigating. So they tried to get the, the recordings, but Amazon said, nope, you're not getting it. Because what would they be divulging if they would instantly hand over that information? Well, they would be releasing and confirming to the public that, yeah, we're listening to you 24 seven, and that is bad publicity. So they didn't want to do that. Um, so it was this big tug of war back and forth, back and forth. And uh, spoiler alert, in the end, they ended up giving over that information to the police 
And it wasn't because they were forced to, it was because the individual that was recorded, he gave his consent. He said, you can give them everything. I'm not hiding anything. I don't expect privacy from this. So get handed all over to the police. So there still is up in the air, this question of can police without a person's consent obtain recordings from Amazon or Apple or other devices that are smart devices that use trigger words to wake up? Um, can we obtain them as if we show probable cause? Still don't have a, a complete answer to this. Um, now I did re, uh, include for y'all to review, if you would like, the actual warrant from this. And it's really interesting if you um, are so inclined to read it. All right, so the, I call this the ESI Texas two-step. So for those of you who dance, the Texas two-step, you go forward once, for or four two times, back two times. And it's this whole back and forth that occurs, right? In order to obtain ESI, there's only two steps. That's it. The first is you have to actually name where the device is. These technical devices don't just float around. You have to say, I want to obtain this cell phone, which is located at 1234 Main Street. You only have one to 14 days to do this. If you try to do it on the 15th day, eh, inadmissible, can't do that. One to 14 days in order to access that device within that specific location. The second phase is then that device is thereafter handed over to an investigator. And this is a pro. This is the person who's gone to school and they have studied um, IT, cyberware, all that fun stuff, right? Now there's no specific time period for this. Why do you think that is? Why would we set one to 14 days for the first, but no time period for the second step? The answer is because technology is pretty darn hard, guys. They have some very smart individuals out there that can set up a lot of technological roadblocks, firewalls, passcodes, passwords. I mean, you name it and they can do it. And that's not something that can just poof automatically be addressed. Sometimes it may take days, weeks, months, or sometimes even years in order to overcome. So that's why the courts do not want to, nor do I ever foresee them doing this, um, specifying a time period for investigators to actually search the device. Now, the person who conducts this computer, let me move my head, this computer search is called a computer forensic analyst. This will be on the test. So what is this job? They basically go in and they, know specifically the procedure to turn on a computer without messing anything up. Because just the simple act of turning on a computer can destroy documents, can invalidate documents. So they do everything in a very precise, uh, structured manner so they can preserve evidence, collect it, identify it, all that amazing stuff. So they're basically the Sherlock Holmes of computers, okay? Now, P.S. The most uh, hired, sought after individual within criminal justice in the, the major federal departments right now are computer forensic analysts. The downside of that is that the majority of them are examining one of two things right now, child pornography, which is, I would imagine, not a fun job, and number two, domestic and international terrorism, okay? So if you're interested in that, there is an individual, um, I believe at Texas State that heads, um, criminal justice and cyber, uh, sorry guys, I'm just going blank today, not enough coffee, uh, cyber-based courses. So if you're interested in that, shoot me an email and I can connect y'all. Okay, so there is also, just like the two-step process for searching and seizing ESI, there's also a super precise process for investigating these things. So again, just turning on the computer, the first thing that they will do, a computer forensic analyst will do, is what's called imaging. Now, I want you to think of imaging as taking a picture. When you take a picture, you're taking a snapshot of everything that you see. That's exactly what imaging is. Imaging is when a computer forensic analyst takes a picture, basically, of everything that's on that device. So, and they only, from thereafter, work on the copy. They will never work on the original. And that's because if they make a mistake, let's say they accidentally erase a bunch of documents, they can always go back to the original and reduplicate it. They're not going to mess up, destroy, damage, or injure 
the original foundation of evidence. Okay, so they'll only ever work on the copy after imaging. Once they do that, they create what's ha what's called hash values. So computers have been around a long time, guys, and um, individuals, there's a lot of smart pe people out there, and they've developed basically a Bible of, or a dictionary, I should say, of codes that they can use to determine if child pornography is present on a computer, embezzlement's present on a computer, all of these different felonious offenses, right? Now, everything has a code. Everything you do on a computer has a code, and I'll give you an example. So if you type in Fox, if you look over on the right, that is the code that will result as a, a re, result as a as a response to that, right? So, what these computer forensic analysts essentially do is they look at specific codes that are associated with different felonies, and they look through that electronically stored uh, imaging device, um, like a phone, a computer a hard drive, a laptop, whatever it is, in order to determine if that is present. Now, there is a problem with this. There is a growing field, and by growing, I mean it has been developing for a good 30 years, um, and it's a group of individuals that are known as anti-forensics. Anti-forensics, their complete goal is to destroy, manipulate, or obstruct justice. So, on the dark web, these individuals, you can buy their, buy their uh, professional skills and ask them to destroy on your hard drive evidence of embezzlement, child pornography, whatever it is. And they have the skills to do that, which presents a major issue for uh, criminal justice to work. Now, there is a hacker that is really interesting to watch. He um, used to, prior to the pandemic, speak in Las Vegas and Austin um, annually. And I included his TED talk, it's really interesting. And he just talks about how easy it is for individuals to engage in anti-forensics. So if you're interested in that, not to do it, <laughs> but just to examine it, then that's a good video. All right, whoop. Excuse me, I was given a fun fact last semester. I'll give you a fun fact from that if you're interested later on. So let me go back, do, do, do. Okay, so again, you image first, you create hash values second. Now, this is a big thing, guys, and this will be on the exam, so listen very carefully because it can be very difficult to absorb. There are, is plain view in the electronic world, depending on the state you are in. Now, I, before I go into this, I just want to point something out. Who is typically on the court? And by court, I mean appellate court, state Supreme Court, and even United States Supreme Court. What does the, the person look like generally? Are they in their 30s, 40s, 50s? Typically, they're uh, higher, older than 55 plus, right, on average, which means their generational familiarity with ele the electronic world is very different than, let's say, y'all, right? So I want you to take that into consideration as we move forward because it may help to explain why these different states approach plain view, the concepts of plain view, the way they do when it comes to the electronic world. So remember, in order to meet plain view, um, first, the officer has to have justification for being in the area. An officer can't just knock on your door, you open it, they see crack, and they're like, plain view, can't do that. Why was he even there in the first place? So it has to be immediately apparent in its criminal nature, and the officer has to have legal justification for even being in that area. Now, the first approach to electronically stored information is called the undifferentiated approach. This happened and well came to light in 2010. That's not that long ago, guys. In United States versus Williams, in that case, a church was receiving very uh, serious, violent, harassing emails. They submitted it to investigators to look into because they were afraid for their safety, and they were able to track these emails because every email has a source, right? And typically, not every time, but generally, it's fairly easy to ascertain who's sending an email, right? So they tracked this person down, and they started looking um, at his computer. And what did they find? Child pornography. Seems to always be a theme. So the court held the evidence as admissible. But wait, that wasn't in any way, shape, or form. That search warrant wasn't related at all to child pornography. At all. So 
the million dollar question you have to think about here is, is something that's found online in a person's computer, is it plain view? Think about all the steps you have to take in order to find different things on your computer. Would you consider that plain view? Depends on what circuit you're in. You may find yourself belonging more to one circuit than the other. Now, the undifferentiated approach basically says, as long as you come across it on a computer, you're a-okay. You don't, it doesn't have to relate to the search warrant. As long as it's a, a felony or an offense of some kind, then it can be admitted, okay? Now, the fourth, first, and third circuits agree with this. What circuit is missing? Us, the Lone Star State, we say, uh-uh, we don't agree with that at all. So the Fifth Circuit is not included in that. We, meaning Texas, do not follow the undifferentiated approach. So the second approach to plain view that I want you to be aware of is the middle ground approach. And it's exactly what you expect it to be. It's kind of a middle ground of uh, not being too lenient like the undifferentiated and not being too harsh like the next one we'll go into, but taking a middle middle stance on things. So they require inadvertence. Inadvertence, guys, means that there's no intent, like you accidentally come across it. That's a better way to phrase it. Middle ground approach means you accidentally come across it. So in this case, 1990 case, a little older, um, they require they obtained a search warrant to search for evidence, uh, basically a massive drug operation, right? The keywords, meaning the hash values, did not work. So then they started just looking. And once they started looking through the files, guess what they found? Yep, again, child pornography. So they kept searching, though, thereafter for child pornography. So they stopped looking for the controlled substances, the drug operation, 100%, and they turned their attention completely to child pornography. Now, the court found, in terms of whether or not they were all admissible, the only the first image was admissible because that was the accidental view. They were looking, looking, looking. Oh, no, look what we found. And instead of stopping there and going and getting a, their warrant extended, their search warrant extended to include this, they kept on looking. That's where they made their mistake. They should have stopped and gotten a warrant for specifically this, but they didn't. They kept on looking. So the court said the first mistake in viewing is considered plain view. The rest of them, not admissible because you intentionally were looking for them and they weren't in the search warrant, the original search warrant. The 10th Circuit and 7th Circuit follow this. Who's missing? Us. So we follow the inapplicability approach. This is the approach that argues that plain view cannot and does not exist in the digital environment. Um, Texas, as well as Louisiana, Mississippi, um, have determined that we do not find that plain view can exist in the digital world because the digital world is very different from the physical world. In the physical world, we can pick up a device. We can pick up a cup. We can pick up things. Whereas in the digital world, you can't do that. It takes you actually manipulating the environment in order to search and find things. You see what word I use there? Manipulate. And what can't you do in plain view? Manipulate. Now, they believe, oh, sorry, um, that plain view doesn't apply at all. So in the first case and in the second case we covered, none of that would be admissible in Texas. None. So um, it's okay if you disagree with that, by the way. Uh, just because we live in a state that has that doesn't mean that you have to agree with it. Um, but just be aware of those three approaches, okay? Because again, they will be on the exam. So moving forward, electronic surveillance. Um, electronic surveillance, guys, is basically wiretapping. You're tapping somebody, you're bugging somebody in order to hear somebody, okay? Now, early on, um, the courts did not require a search warrant because they didn't think that just overhearing somebody using some type of device um, indicated any type of physical entry needed, right? So the first case that really looked at that was Olmstead versus United States. Here, let's say this is a wall and here's an apartment over here, here's another apartment right here. They set the hearing device right here on this apartment in order to hear everything that was in this apartment. So guess what they didn't have to do? They never had to go into this side at all. 
So the court said they never physically had to enter the apartment, so they didn't need a search warrant for that. So they permitted wiretapping uh, without a search warrant because they didn't have to physically enter into that other apartment. Yikes, right? So moving on, whoops, let me go back here. So moving on, you all now know that that progressed, that evolved into the CAT standard. We no longer believed in the Olmstead standard. We said, hey, number one, does a person have a reasonable expectation of privacy? And number two, is it one that society agrees with? If the answer is yes, then we don't care if they had to physically enter into that area or not, they need a search warrant. So it's more of an expectation approach as opposed to just focusing on physical presence. Now, you will see this in your textbook and you'll see it in different writings. The Omnibus Crime Control Streets Act of 1968. Don't refer to it like this, nobody does. Just refer to it as Title III and that governs surveillance. So, Title III. Title III is what um, allows the government to intercept, meaning steal your conversation, overhear your phone calls, overhear what you say in your car. Um, but in order to do, to do that, they have to show that the person is or has committed or will commit a specific crime. And that particular communications concerning the offense will be obtained through the interception. Sound familiar? If it's not broke, guys, don't fix it. It's the same exact analysis that you would use for a typical search warrant. So the only added addition to that is that normal investigative effort procedures have been tried and have failed or that they're just not feasible. So you may be asking, well, what does that look like? I will show you. If you have a dog that barks like crazy, then is it, is it reasonable or even feasible that you as an investigator can enter onto that property to put place a bug on, or wiretap on that uh, property in order to overhear a suspect or suspects? No, because the dog will give you away in two seconds. So that's an example of um, regular investigative procedures not working. And so the interception order would allow various efforts in order to overhear those people using different means, right? Same thing with um, organized crime. Some organized crime groups um, require you to put your family up as collateral. Now, depending on how well you like your family, <laughs> you probably don't want to do that, right? So you wouldn't even want to take um, regular investigative efforts by, let's say, infiltrating the group and pretending like you're one of them and you go undercover because that would place your entire family at risk. So instead, Title III would permit you to instead wiretap them, much safer. So here are some of the examples of wiretapping that you can engage in under Title III. Now, a roving wiretap. A roving wiretap is exactly that. It roves around. So a roving wiretap follows the person, not the place. So um, if you're, let's say, on your cell phone, you're typically not in one place. I remember having to share, I have three older sisters, and I remember having to share one landline with three older sisters, and it was connected because it had, you know, the the wire to the wall and we would like run around and wrap ourselves up in it so that the other person wouldn't be able to hear what we were saying right you no longer have that problem so now most interceptions follow the person that's making the communications as opposed to let's say a specific landline although it can do that too so typically a roving wiretap um, pertains to cars or cell phones all right so in order to execute an interception order, um, there's not a specific time frame. They don't say one to 14 days, like in the electronically stored information based search warrant. Here, you're asking the court to allow you to wiretap somebody. But if you set a timeline on that, that would be tough because sometimes it requires you as an investigator to sneak into their, uh, their business or their house in order to place a bug. Well, that takes time and planning and things often fall through. Um, so that is why there's not a specific time frame. They say instead, as soon as practicable. So you have to look at basically whether or not the delay was or was not reasonable. So a five month delay in installing an interception device, 
that may be considered practicable. Um, the court has held that since it was a very difficult process and the crime was continuing, probable cause had been refreshed by visual surveillance, so five months was okay. So as long as you are able to justify to the court that everything is still uh, rocking and rolling, there's still a crime being committed, you still have probable cause, then most likely a, a long delay may be seen as okay. A separate order for entry is unnecessary because once you place a bug someplace, guess what you have to do? You have to go back and get it. You can't just leave it. So you don't have to get another uh, search warrant in order to gain re-access to get it, okay? Um, that's unnecessary. Some things to take into consideration. You have to minimize the interception. So look at what your interception order is for. If there is evidence of other crimes, you um, let's say you're listening to somebody who's on the phone and your focus is instead on drugs, but yet they start talking about prostitution and human trafficking, but you don't want to stop the recording because then you might lose some really valuable information. But what you have to do is once you get that information recorded, you still have to go back and get an interception order based on those other crimes, again, as soon as practicable. Um, but once you get what you need, say they talk and they give all the information you want or could possibly gather on their drug operation, then you have to stop. You can't just keep on listening because they have some juicy gossip. Your max, though, for a Title III interception order is 30 days. That's all those interception orders last. 30 days. That's it. So it's from that point on. So 30 days has ended. From that point on, you have 90 days to provide an invoice or notice to the person you recorded. So let's say I get a notice today that says, last month we recorded all your phone conversations and we got the fact that you were doing X, Y, and Z. So they're fulfilling due process. They're giving you notice. So that way you have an opportunity to defend yourself. See, there's still due process there. As in everything, guys, there's exceptions. Exceptions to Title III, just like everything in law. So the number one thing that you have to consider is there's no prior interception order needed if there's immediate danger. So if there is an incident in which somebody's physical life or safety is at risk and you don't have time to go get an interception order, then by all means, go ahead and start recording. Um, basically, if you don't have enough time, but you still thereafter have to get an interception order within 48 hours. So you have 48 hours to apply after the interception order has, or the interception of that information, that communication has occurred. So an example is, man says to an undercover officer that he plans on killing Bobby for stiffing him on the last drug shipment from Honduras. Is this an exigent circumstance? You should have said instantly, no, because he says he's planning on it. He doesn't say when, he doesn't give any type of time frame. So that gives you the indication that you can go to court apply for a Title III interception order and start recording all of his phone conversations that may be more indicative of a plan, right? In contrast, what about this? Man says to an undercover officer on a Saturday that he's tired of paying taxes and is taking his plane the next day to crash it into the IRS office. Is this an exigent a circumstance? Yeah, why? Happened on a Saturday, most government offices, facilities are closed on a Saturday. He could call it in, but still it may take too much time. Um, so this may be more indicative of him being able to go ahead and instantly record everything that person is saying, plant a bug on him, plant some type of interception on him in order to confirm his plans and be proactive, arrest him before he actually commits this crime. This actually did happen, by the way, in Austin. Um, it was, I think in 2012, man was mad at the IRS, crashed his little plane, I think his little Cessna into the, the office building. It was on the weekend. Luckily, not a lot of people are hurt. I think one person was killed. Um, well, two counting the guy that was mad. Um, so that's a good example. All right, another example is, is willful and voluntary disclosures. So I include this link. I highly recommend you watch it um, because it shows how there's a serial killer. And I think he was called the shipping container killer that was caught a few years ago. And that's not funny. I'm not laughing at that. What I am laughing about is that 
he left a whole trail of evidence on Amazon. He would buy these products and he left reviews. He would say like, great shovel. It was fantastic for digging up, a, you know, burying a body with. And they used all of that against him. They didn't have to get any type of search warrant, any type of interception order in order to use that information against him. Um, another example that is an exception to the interception order is a provider exception. When you were admitted to Texas State University, you signed a whole lot of documents, right? I'm betting a lot of you did not review those documents. One of the things that you agreed to was that the university has the ability to monitor your emails to ensure that you're not making money using your email. So you can't, FYI, if you're doing this, stop, but um, you can't use your Texas State email address to operate a business. That's a no-no. So they have the right to monitor, to review all of your communications um, because it's the ordinary course of business to ensure that you're not violating their uh, standards for the university. They don't need an interception order for that. Now, anything that's accept basically accessible to the public, including web pages, uh, public broadcast TV, radio shows, podcasts. Now, this is a biggie. Um, there's a woman in Florida a few years ago who was fired because she was openly discussing teaching these children very um, racist, anti-Semitic uh, information that was horrifying. And she said, well, you can't record my classes. And they said, we didn't have to. You talked about it and confirmed it in your podcast. They didn't need an interception order for that because she was uh, seeking people to subscribe to her podcast. So social media, po social media posts. Nothing you say online, guys, is private. Why do I say that? If you post anything on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, whatever it is, even if it's to a friend and you have your profile set to private, guess what could happen? That friend that you post that to can easily reveal it to a million people, right? So it depends on, one, whether or not your profile is public or private. And then two, whether or not your friend or friends are willing and able um, to offer that information to the police without the police seeking that information via a search warrant. So they could easily just call in one of your friends for an interview and say, hey, can you show us what they posted last week? And your friend can say, yep, here you go. They don't need an interception order for that. All right, so boop. That is it for this week, guys. I'm really excited to see how y'all tackle this week's pack back. I hope everybody's safe, warm, uh, have water. If you don't, please reach out to me. Um, I'm more than happy to help in any way I can. And I think that's it. All right. Adios, guys. Bye.